Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, welcome back to our Center for Global Management series um, of talks about the COVID-19. Today we have a very special guest and we are really happy and I'm very proud um, and excited that we're going to have Professor Ed Niemer talking to us about making decisions with unknown data, dealing with something that we have not dealt with before, and how do we put together a policy response under these circumstances? So it reminds me uh, the notion of unknowns, unknowns, uh, but we will see what our great colleague, Professor Beamer, uh, has for us. So uh, we're going to um, uh, work the way we usually do. We're going to have uh, Professor Lemer uh, make a presentation um, for as long as he wants. And then we're going to start a conversation where uh, you can take part and ask questions. And I will filter them and uh, change them a little and make them really tough uh, questions for Professor Lemer. And you can use Slido and the text um, for um, the, the code is 63. One eight nine. So, uh, Professor Lemer, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and hello to all my friends and relatives, and former students who are in this audience. I wish I was in the same room with you, so we could touch elbows, possibly, or maybe a few months from now we could shake hands, or maybe what does come take six months, and maybe a year or two from now we can actually hug each other and uh, return to being humans again. But right now we have a lingering, very serious lingering problem with the coronavirus. And I want to talk about what it all means for our lives and about decision making. So I want to, I want to share my screen now, I guess. Okay, I hope you all can uh, see the screen as I can. If not, somebody ought to alert me. Uh, we're gonna talk about decisions with known and unknown probabilities. And here's the key messages. First are a set of ideas regarding knowledge creation in ambiguous settings. Ambiguous means you don't know the probabilities. <clears throat> the statistical theory that you learned in your class does not apply to exploratory studies of non-experimental data, the kind of data that we have to rely on now. Machine learning fails when it doesn't make use of the wisdom and insights of the practitioners, mainly you. Visual images are essential for exploratory work. Numbers don't work well. Humans are much better at pictures than they are at numbers. And it takes a good story to turn a basket of correlations into a conclusion for you and for your audience. Pictures and stories, I think, are essential. Something the Embas will remember pretty well, I think. And then my biggest advice of all is plan on learning how to create knowledge here at UCLA, not just memorizing stuff that the faculty lecture about. <clears throat> here are some findings that we'll get to in a few minutes. California counties with, with higher shares of elderly have lower COVID-19 incidents, which I think is the exact opposite what most people would have expected. We're going to talk about that soon. The unemployment rate, when it zooms up in recessions, it takes a long time to get back to where it was. The same thing is true with the stock market. You'll see some visual images that, dis that demonstrate that. Through March 2020, it's the young whose jobs have been hit the hardest. For Anderson students, management consulting is still looking good, but April data may end that. And that April data comes out this week on Friday. And if you if you think about planning your future, I'd be taking a close look at all that data that comes out on Friday. Here's preliminary advice. Uh, you ought to be writing more. Joan Didion says, I don't know what I think until I write it down. Flannery O'Connor, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. I heard Sidney Harmon explain that he had his top managers write a progress report every month and submit it to him, not because he was going to read it, but because he believed the process of writing is what created understanding and wisdom for his managers. So I say my advice is write a paragraph or two about this experience today. 
what should be remembered, if anything. Even the best stuff is finding out the errors I make. I'd be very, very happy to hear them. And more generally, stop touching your cell phone so much and try creating sentences and paragraphs. That's how to create knowledge and wisdom and understanding that you cannot create, that you usually create with direct conversations. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about risk versus uncertainty per Frank Knight. Not obvious what the words mean, but for Frank Knight, risk means known probabilities. It's kind of like you're, you're a, a manager of a baseball team and trying to decide who to select as a pinch hitter. That decision is going to be heavily influenced by historical batting averages, data uh, helping you predict the future. Uncertainty has unknown probabilities. An uncertain situation is sufficiently unique that you cannot rely on a statistician's study of historical data or on machine learning. It takes a practitioner, a, a practitioner's wisdom to make the decision in an ambiguous setting, though of course informed by the historical data. So these are three uh, names that you might want to put into your impress your friends list. At the, to at the left is the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who in 1763 wrote a paper that discusses what we today call the conditional probability rule. That was based on known probabilities, not unknown. In the middle is uh, John Maynard Keynes book, A Treatise on Probability. Uh, you think of Keynes as an economist, and he indeed he was, but he wrote a rather unique book uh, arguing that probabilities are not numbers, but intervals. The probability of rain next week is not a number, it's a number between zero and 10%, something like that. And at the far right, it's Frank Knight's book, Risk, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, in which he argued entrepreneurs are working in a setting of uncertainty, meaning unknown probabilities, not risk. And it's their instincts that lead to profit, not risk, uncertainty per Frank Knight. So planning is the essential issue here, which is if you have known probabilities, you can plan in advance what you're going to do with any possible data set. Uh, sampling properties of an estimator are computed on the assumption that the same estimator is used regardless of the sample, on the assumption that the plan is actually carried out. This is what Dwight Eisenhower said about plans. Plans are useless, but planning essential. So in the battle <coughs> to make the data confess, it's great if you come in with your idea of, of what a sample mean or some other estimator might be, but you don't want to actually use that when you're into battle. You want to throw that out. Planning prepares you, but the plans themselves are useless. Sherlock Holmes, in a study of Scarlet, made a more extreme warning. No data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. So he says, don't plan how you're going to interpret the data. Wait till you have all the evidence. Well, to me, that's a little extreme. I think the plans can be helpful. Uh, you just need to uh, have uh, ways of not following the plans perfectly when things suggest otherwise. Speaking of planning, and I wrote this op-ed in December 2019 and in uh, LA Times, with the recession risk elevating, now is the time for a personal stress test. Is your family business relying on income from jobs or sales that are threatened? Do you have debt service obligations that depend on significantly at-risk earnings? If yes, sell off some assets now to retire some of that debt. In other words, deleverage. Leverage is a great idea early in expansion, a bad choice, but a bad choice when the expansion ends. In other words, you got to build recessions into your future plans because these things are definitely going to occur and you need to be prepared for them when they come. Uh, speaking of planning, there are many Anderson School graduates who are trying to decide which direction to, to go when they're looking for jobs this summer or, or later on. And the proposal is you want to have jobs that are recession proof, you want to have jobs in sectors that are growing, and you want them not to be hurt badly by the COVID-19 uh, <clears throat> attacks. So here we have the employment uh, all set to zero at uh, uh, January 1990 and growing thereafter in four categories of jobs that Anderson School students might take, management consulting, securities, accounting, and retail banking. And take a look at this. The reds represent the recessions. The red verticals are the recessions. So can you find one of these sectors that seems pretty un 
unaffected by the recessions in which jobs were not declining. And it looks to me like retail banking is the one. Retail banking had a big peak there in 2007, six and seven, when the, you had that housing boom and all those mortgage-backed securities were being created. But it's a very low growth sector. And for that reason, it doesn't seem attractive. What does seem attractive is managing management consulting. That's been extremely high growth. The other ones, the securities and accounting, had a lot of growth in the 1990s, but much, not much thereafter. Uh, what about COVID resistant? This data goes through March 2020, except for management consulting, which is not yet reporting the last two months. But you don't see any evidence of decline as through March. You're going to see some evidence of decline in other sectors in a few minutes, but not in any of these. But, but the release on Friday is the thing to watch to find out which of these sectors is going to be immune to the COVID-19 disease and which ones are not. So we're now going to move <clears throat> into a study of California counties, the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID infection rates in California counties, and we're going to contrast following a plan, so what's called confirmatory data analysis, with exploratory data analysis, where you make up the plan as you go. <laughs> and the, the plan is, involves a commitment to a choice of model before you see the data and allows you to calculate sampling properties like bias and variance. A plan is carried out all numerically. You don't need no reason to do visual displays. This is really appropriate when you have randomized controlled trials in which the choice of the model is not a great concern. In the real world, most of our decisions are made with non-experimental data. And uh, that's a setting in which you're going to want to make numerous changes in the model before you make a decision. Model discovery is greatly aided with visual displays. Exploratory work is essential for all data not created with randomized trials. Here's an illustration. We're going to try to, to decide whether uh, uh, population density is having an impact on COVID-19 cases per capita. And a data analysis plan is to run a regression explaining the logarithm of cases per capita with the log logarithm of residents per square mile. And this is sort of studying the potential impact of social distancing, as if you could take uh, San Francisco, which has the densest population, and turn it into Alpine, which has the least dense, and make the disease rate uh, make an adjustment because you've created, in, in effect, a lower density county via social distancing. Um, well, that's what this thing here says. It's the estimated percent change of infection rate is percentage change in, um, you read that. Uh, the, what, ha what happened, this fails. That was the plan, it failed. The reason it failed is there are about six counties, I guess, that have not yet reported COVID-19 cases, and you can't take the logarithm of zero. So you run that plan and it immediately fails. So you have to figure out, what are you gonna do with those counties? One way to figure that out is to look at a scatter diagram. So here we have the population per square mile on the horizontal axis and the COVID cases per resident on the vertical axis, they're both log scales. So if you look at the vertical scale, it goes from, uh, across counties, it goes from about 0 0.0001 up to 0 0.001, but that's a factor of 10 over the interval of, of uh, data that we have here. So that's a big increase in COVID cases per capita. Now, in, in the lower left-hand uh, side of this image, I've circled uh, six counties, I believe. Those are the counties that have zero cases. And what you see displayed is the case rate where you have put one case in it. And it looks like it kind of fits the rest of the scatter, so that's okay. But there are these outliers, Mono, Indio, and Alpine in the up, upper left, uh, Lake, Del Norte, Tuolumne, Tehami, Butte on the lower right. What, <clears throat> how many of you know where those counties are? Those sound like pretty small counties to me, that suggests we ought to do population weighting. The data are gonna be more accurate where there are greater population levels. So let's make a same scatter diagram, but now the, now the data are displayed in a way that indicates the size of the population. The area of these bubbles represents the county populations. A big bu bubble 
is Los Angeles. It's by far the biggest county. And down here in the lower left were all those numbers that we're worried about. They're very small counties, and we don't want to rely on them because their statistical error is larger down there than it is up where there are lots of, lots of people living. So uh, we, we made some changes in our plan, but moving forward, let's take a look at a map. Maps are extremely useful when you have geographic variability. This map you're looking at is the COVID-19 cases per capita color-coded, where the red are the 20% of counties with the highest rates, the green is the lowest up in the north, and the yellow are the interior, mostly those are in between. So it's the red ones we want to worry about. That's where the COVID cases are highest per capita. And you can see Los Angeles is one of them, and you can see a cluster up there in the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Mateo, Alameda, and Santa Clara. But up there in the northeast, there's Mono and Inyo. Why do they have high rates? They are low density places. And I can see, as I look at you through my computer, I can see a bunch of you are skiers. And you know, because you went in January to ski at Mammoth, which is located in Mono, and maybe you or some of your friends took disease with you, Inyo has Death Valley, also a nice place to visit in the wintertime. So folks from these affected counties and from other parts of the country are visiting these areas and carrying the coronavirus with them. Santa Barbara's here too, maybe it's also a tourist destination. So let's try to deal with that by adding a variables, the share of employment in hotels, share of employment at restaurants, pick that up. We know assistant living is a problem. So let's add employment and assistant living to the model. And that fails too. None of those variables really passes the usual test of, of uh, reliability. And that's disappointing, but I knew that the employment and assistant livings was, uh, it was weak because there were a lot of counties that didn't report, probably for confidentiality reasons. So I said, well, let's add another variable, which is the population share over 65. And you add that one, that turns out to be a hugely important variable when it competes with these other three, but it's a big negative. Because I was thinking over 65 would bring out higher rates of incidents, and it actually brings out lower, apparently. So why is that? Well, maybe it's because the elderly are not employed. And people who go to work and interact at a workplace, that's where they get the diseases. And that's what the cause is. So although that one failed, maybe we can do better if we add another variable, which is employment divided by population. You add that in there. And that turns out negative. And also the share of the population over 65 is still a big negative. Well, I'm thinking there's 400 of you who are thinking of the reasons why this occurred and the mistake I'm making. But what I'm going to do is to try to make this seem plausible by telling a story and explaining why it's the case that the elderly actually bring down the COVID-19 disease rate. Well, it's because they have naturally isolated lives, first of all, and they're very aware of the risk if they don't socially isolate. And that's why these, these counties with large fractions of population over 65 have relatively low COVID-19 uh, incidents. So now let's move on to the economy. See, we're making pretty good time here. Uh, th this is uh, an image that makes you that reveals what we do when we forecast the economy. We look backward to see forward. So you can imagine driving a vehicle where you couldn't look forward. You can only look backward and drive your car accordingly. Or the way I, I pose it here, the question is, does that big hole in the road, I mean, looking back and seeing the problems that occurred historically, does that hole in the road in a rear view mirror tell you about the next hole? How deep and how soon? So this is a situation in which, uh, you really do. Are you looking backward and, and kind of backing into the future? And how well is that going to work for you? So in order to think about this, you've got to think, first of all, what is GDP? It's the sales. We're going to look at two things, GDP and unemployment. GDP is the sales value of all goods and services produced in a selected geographic area for a selected period of time. Uh, it's not perfect. If it isn't sold, it isn't counted. The meals you are cooking and serving at home do not add to GDP. 
the reduction in road congestion and air pollution that comes with social distancing does not add to GDP. The money you are saving on gas, gasoline, is subtracted from GDP. And when you get sick and have to go to the doctor, that adds to GDP. So it's not perfect. Uh, we're going to go back to GDP in a minute, but I want to talk about log scales first, because we're going to use that when we study the, the GDP data. This is an image that comes from the New York Times, updated every day, that shows the COVID death rates, deaths, uh, total deaths, in countries all over the world using a log scale. So you can see the in a log scale, the distance between 100 and 200 is about on the vertical on the left-hand side. The dis distance between 100 and 200 is about the distance between 1,000 and 2,000. A log scale squeezes those upper numbers down. And what it does is it turns the constant rates of growth into straight lines. So let's take a look. That's a line that the New York Times has put in there. That's doubling every week. Anything moving along parallel to that line is doubling. If you we use this to decide when the US was doubling every week, uh, look, when did it have the, about the same rate? It looks like about 35 days uh, into the COVID-19 uh, crisis. But this image suggests to me, things are getting grow, great. Things are getting great. We've had a period of very high uh, growth rates of these COVID-19 infections. And now it's all leveling out. But the, the New York Times has another display that tells something entirely different, something very worrisome. And that's an uh, image of the actual new cases. So at the top, that's the global image. So rather than declining, that has reached a plateau. In the United States, the same thing, but down below. You have some decline, but basically you're at a higher level. And remember, in the US, with 1.1 million cases, that's and 300 million people. That's a tiny fraction of people who have actually been affected, and lots more infections to come. So these images said this thing isn't going to go away anytime soon, not at all. So here's the log scale GDP, and I I produced this graph because it really tells you what macroeconomics is all about. One is to determine the long term, long run growth of the U.S. economy, and back in the 50s it was three percent. In the 60s, we jumped up to almost 5%. Then we have 40 years of 3.1%, 3%. And in the recession of 2008 and 9, we dipped down a little bit. And since then, we've been growing at a lower rate. Now the question is, how big is the dip going to be? And are we going to come back into that corridor that is currently there? Or are we going to be at a lower corridor? Are we going to be at a lower rate? That's the question that macroeconomists need to be answering. And it isn't easy. It isn't easy to come up with that. Another feature of recession is that it's a period of unwanted idleness. This is labor idleness, but you have factories that have lower capacity utilization. We have offices with vacancies and apartments with vacancies. But here we have the unwanted idleness of labor, where the unemployment rate jumps up dramatically. And that's the yellow uh, verticals. And over at the right, you can see that 4.4%, that's the March number. Already a dramatic increase. The next one is going to jump up to maybe 15%. The one that's released on uh, this Friday is going to be dramatically terrible. So the question then is, what, what can we learn from the previous uh, recessions? That first image that you see shows you how much increase that occurred during the recession. What percent? increase did unemployment have and 2009 was the worst that was about five percent but that yellow represents what's likely to occur in the next couple of months in fact there could be even more so we're in a totally different environment both in terms of how the unemployment was created and also the scale of it which is unprecedented the question what we need to ask is how long is this going to last so this image that i just put up here has blue vertical bars that represent how long the recession lasted, how long it took to have that elevated unemployment rate like you see on the left. And the green then represents how long it took to get back to where it was. And you can see the most recent green, greens are over six years. Many are over four or five. So unemployment is something that zooms up rapidly but declines very slowly. And that's worrisome. 
uh, in, their, in these circumstances. So why does it re go down so slowly? Why doesn't just uh, uh, drop down to where it had been before? And the reason is, one reason is employment's a relationship, not a one night stand. Uh, it takes trust and understanding. It requires a good fit between employee and employer. Once severed, it takes time and energy to create new ones. A normal recession brings an end to the least successful relationships, and both parties are slow to form new ones or renew new ones. Uh, in addition, a recession puts emphasis on cost control. Uh, the uh, our firms are going to retain and hire the most productive, most reliable workers. The others are going to have a hard time finding jobs. Firms are going to hire robots instead of humans to control costs. They're going to want proof of revenues before they ramp up uh, employment. And if they've got existing debt, it makes them very difficult to increase costs in the form of, of, uh, of uh, payrolls because they've got to use every ounce of energy they have in order to avoid defaults and delinquencies. And then here's another picture that I think is worrisome. This is the value of the Dow Jones divided by the consumer price index uh, over, uh, since 1910, I guess. And it's been growing at a rate of 2.4% per year. But are these long periods of time, uh, there's a, 1929 peak and we were at that same level in almost 1990. Think about that. There's another long episode, another long episode. Are we about ready to have another long episode where we're not going to see that peak? Those episodes were uh, the 60 years after the September 1929, 29 years after, after uh, September 1995, 12 and a half years after August 2000. What comes now, I ask rhetorically. It's a source of concern, it seems to me. Uh, this time is different. Nature and human society together are in control. The social system we call the economy has a healthy phase and an unhealthy phase, expansions and recessions. The word recession suggests an organism that is normally growing but occasionally becomes diseased and recedes. It's not a mechanical system, it's an organism. So macroeconomists are like epidemiologists studying what causes recessions, what medicines can prevent them, and what medicines can make them briefer and less severe. So far, the best treatments macroeconomists have to offer are bloodletting and hydrochloroquine, also known as fiscal monetary policy. That's a comment, by the way. Uh, this time is dif different, totally different. Nature attacked when the economy was healthy. Nature's attack was sudden and vicious. Humans protected themselves by shutting down non-essential parts of the economy, perhaps 25 or 30 percent. Customers and business owners now, they're the ones who decide whether to reopen the economy or not, not mayors or governors or, or pr the president. Businesses cannot reopen with customers. Businesses will be reluctant to open if the customers expose the employees to the virus. Consumers will be uh, reluctant to visit businesses when the risk of contract and disease stays high. So actually it's nature, together with humans, who will negotiate the rate of return to normal. And then I asked this question, what's the best medicine for this situation? And that little uh, figure is making my uh, humor, my poor little humor about bloodletting and hydrochloroquine uh, apparent. And then this is where we are now. What is the appropriate medicine? Here's the early data. Uh, this is TSA checkpoint counts compared to what they were last year. And you can see they start out about where they were on, on March 1st. They go down a little bit the first couple of weeks, and then they just collapse in the last two weeks of March. A little bit improvement now, but it's back to 6.8% of what it was last year. Imagine you were running a business and you lost 94% of your customers. What the heck would you do about that? Here's the early data on weekly unemployment claims, which jumped up to 3 million in the week of March 21, and then 6.8 million, 6.6. .6. They're declining a little bit, but it adds up to 30.6 million unemployment claims. That's about 20% of payroll jobs. That calls for the unemployment rate to jump up to something like 20%. It's scary. Never seen anything like this before. Uh, th this data shows you the, the um, payroll data that was released uh, that re refers to payrolls on March 12th. So the vertical uh, arrow that I have here shows you the change between February and March. 
we lost 701,000 jobs. And these sectors are sorted by which are the biggest uh, contributor to that 701, headed by leisure and hospitality, which was 459. That was 65% of the tr trouble. Education and health services, that's actually health services, by the way. Professional business services, those were not the ones that we saw before, by the way, in retail trade. But the takeaway is really leisure and hospitality has been pummeled by this already through uh, March 12th of, of this year. Here's the GDP first quarter that was released, and it was down 4.8%. And of that, of the, and then you've got a whole bunch of components, durables, non-durable services, structures, equipment, intellectual property, et cetera. But the component that almost fully explains that GDP decline is consumer services. So what's, which component of consumer services was that? Uh, the services contributed uh, minus 5.61 to a four, minus 4.8. Minus 2.25 came from healthcare. So the story is that everybody stopped going to the doctors unless you had that coronavirus incident. So it's a surprising effect, but it's healthcare was very badly affected uh, in, the, uh, in the first quarter already. Recreation services and food services also hardly hit, hard hit. Here, what about a population, employment to population ratio through March 2020? I have put a circle indicating that these are employment to population ratios subtracted, subtracted from then the level that they had on January, in January 2020. So they start out at zero. The 20 to 24 year olds have lost 4% of their employment by uh, March. The 20, whoops, previous, previous, the 25 to 34 year olds, the 16 to 19 year olds, all the youth have been pummeled. On the right hand side, there's a lot about have women being more adversely affected than men, but this data doesn't suggest that. It looks like it's kind of comparable. So let's look forward now. The, the reasons for slower recovery are fear of contracting COVID-19, it's not going away soon. Fear of bankruptcy, troubling debt loads, fear of foreigners, shrinking of the global supply chains. We had a lot of economic growth in the last couple of decades that was created by globalization. We're going to lose that as we shrink in the economy. Uh, you need to be alert to the difference between the annualized rate of change and the actual rate of change. So here, here's a congressional budget office. And this is the what I've circled here is the rate of change at an annualized rate in real GDP. And it's minus 3.5 followed by minus 39.6. But up above is the actual change. Instead of 39.6, the actual decline is 11.8. And it's annualized by multiplying by four with some compounding in order to turn that quarterly decline into an annualized rate. So I think now is not the time to talk about annualized rates because the quarters are so weird and, and we won't be making that mistake. So here's the, the uh, Display real GDP around the cycle peak. So it says zero at the horizontal axis, but that's a cycle peak. And you can see GDP growing until it gets to the cycle peak. And then it declines by maybe three or 4%. And then you get rapid growth back to more normal. And into this image, I've, I put a 2% growth rate, which is the normal rate that you saw in the earlier slide. And, 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 uh, in the recovery of the nine, of the uh, <clears throat> from the last recession, we grew at two percent. Was it a totally different kind of episode? What about the Anderson forecast? That's that one there. It's very V-shaped. It's very V-shaped. So the premise of this is, at the end of a year, we will have the virus under control, and we'll all go back to our restaurants, and we'll all go back to airlines, and we'll go out on cruises, and then you'll have a rapid recovery turn to normalcy. I, I'm inclined to think that's pretty optimistic. The decline that you see in GDP is probably too little, and the return back to uh, toward that 2% uh, trend is probably too rapid. Here's the unemployment data. Same kind of thing. We've got unemployment, according to the Anderson forecast, jumping up to above 12%, and then pretty rapidly go back to normal after only two years. So it's not six or seven years, but a couple of years. 
the premise of this is this time is different and it's possible we could get the rapid uh, improvement in the labor market. So then one more thing, my final slide. <clears throat> There's this article that was released by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York titled Pandemic Change, Pandemics Change Cities. And it talks about how the cities inside of Germany that suffered the largest declines in municipal spending because of the uh, virus, the 1918-1919 virus, that's where voter extremism became the greatest. That's where Nazi got, Nazism got started. So here's my comment. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Now is the time to say thanks to all the folks who have lost their jobs helping us to contain the pandemic. They are not unemployed, they are working for us. Those of us with jobs should be contributing to these workers via tax that is used to maintain their incomes 100%. We should be rewarding the frontline workers in healthcare, groceries, police, and so on. They are taking on levels of risk that they never expected. They deserve a bonus from the rest of us. Let's start thinking like a large family would and value not the material success of our family members, but instead how much they contribute to our community. We need a new America where everybody is happy and proud. Now is the time to decide, should we continue to separate or should we unite? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ed, for a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, uh, some questions coming in through Slido and let me, uh, before going on, let me um, say something I forgot to say. Um, this is co uh, sponsored by the forecast, uh, UCLA Anderson forecast. And, Ed made uh, a number of references uh, to the forecast, including the V-shaped uh, recession. Uh, so uh, we have uh, quite some time now for a conversation uh, with Ed. So let me, let me start by asking, uh, it seems to me that uh, everything is conditional on the vaccine and or treatment. Um, how, would you, I'm not going to ask you how soon do you think it's going to happen because I, I assume that you don't know. But how does your analysis change from a conceptual point of view if one takes into account that condition? I mean, how would you, or what is implicit in what you said? Um, uh, well, that, that, uh, Rapid decline in the unemployment rate and the good growth rates of GDP, not in this year, but next year, are premised on the idea that either a vaccine or a treatment is going to make people comfortable and go back to the kinds of lives they had before. If that's not true, that gets pushed back in time. And my own view is the longer it lasts, the harder it is to recover, because you make these permanent changes in the way be people behave, the way they think, and it makes that whole world, uh, that world that we knew three or four months ago, much more difficult to reestablish. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's that's great. Let me let me move to a, a, another question, one that is uh, has been asked here by our viewers. Uh, um, and let me add to, to to that question. You've pointed out in the past in a very influential paper that um, the business cycle is really the housing market. What do you think is going to happen to that particular um, um, industry or, or, or sector? Um, is, there a, is it uh, in for a particular uh, decline or, I mean, how do you see it? Well, um, prior to this um, March, the housing sector was not overbuilt the way it has been in all these other uh, episodes where you had a collapse in housing. Uh, when we were talking about whether a recession is imminent, that was one of the reasons that we didn't think it would occur because as you said, I wrote that piece about housing is the business cycle. It's not the only case. So we've had a downturn in 1953 that was caused by the federal government rapidly cutting defense spending when the Korean armistice was signed. And then we also had another episode in, in uh, 2000 and 2001 when the tech sector and the rest of businesses cut back spending on equipment and software, and that caused a recession. But otherwise, it's been housing. This time was not destined to be housing. The economy was completely healthy in all regards, 
as of the beginning of this year. So now the hypothetical is, as soon, if we can get this coronavirus under control, we're going to flip the switch and be back where we were, which means housing is going to be okay. There's going to still a lot of room for housing. We're way underbuilt here in California based on the population growth compared to the number of new units. Uh, so I, I, I would remain uh, optimistic about housing going forward. But if, again, if this becomes long term, and if we create more debt problems for our households that might be potential buyers, then it's going to be a big trouble because it's, it's, we've got all these students with this heavy debt load and they need to have uh, revenue and earnings in order to draw down that debt. And we have a lot of other consumers who are going to go into debt in order to maintain some level of quality of lives in terms of what they eat and where they live. And that's going to work against the housing market. But my own view is I, I would, if I were betting on something, a return, I would think housing would be okay. So let me, let me stay on, there are lots of questions here on the housing uh, market. Uh, and let me, let me try to relate that to what you said earlier about density. So uh, here in, uh, in uh, the city of Los Angeles and uh, um, Santa Monica, I don't know if, uh, uh, I think it's the whole state actually, there is this push to allow people who own houses, homes, to build a second unit in their backyard as a way of easing the shortage of housing. But at the same time, that is increasing density. Do you see this trade-off like uh, um, having any role going forward? Do you think, let me put it in, do you think that people are going to try to avoid living in high density or increasing density um, uh, places or cities? Or well, that's similar to the question of when are they going to go back to restaurants or when are they going to go on a cruise again? Um, my view is that we need to have the public health authorities tell us that they are going to behave differently going forward. And if there's the slightest news about a new virus, they're going to, somewhere in the globe, they're going to create uh, containment procedures that will prevent the community spread like we've experienced this time. And they're going to need to do that in a credible way so that we'll all feel comfortable living in these higher density communities. Otherwise, you know, there, there's a huge economic force that pushes us to more dense situations because the land gets more and more expensive. And the denser the housing is, the less land that we individuals actually need. So that's not going to go away. So let me, let me go back to something that you said, that uh, uh, jobs are relationships. And uh, it, they are not one night stands. Um, and so relationships, as we know, are, take time to build. And a very important element is trust. Now, uh, you, you've also said that this time it's different. I mean, that's what you kept repeating. So um, if I own a restaurant, I keep in touch with the people who work there. I talk to them on the phone. We have our WhatsApp list and we exchange news and um, I uh, send them uh, greetings when their little girl has a birthday. So then all of a sudden the vaccine appears. Wouldn't we uh, overnight go back to back to, to where we were? I mean, and behind this, some of the questions are, there are lots of furloughs now rather than dismissals. Correct. Um, do you think that that would make a difference? I mean, temporary layoffs as opposed to permanent layoffs and so on and so forth. So let, let me say something about furloughs because that makes the unemployment data unreliable. It, that unemployment that's released on May 8th, on Friday, <clears throat> is based on a survey where they ask you, were you employed on April 12th? And if no, were you looking for a job? People who are furloughed might not be reporting that they were looking for a job. So that data set is going to be contaminating. And then secondly, what you described as a uh, kind of overnight <clears throat> return to where we were, that can work if, it, uh, if the uh, light switch comes on soon. But the longer that lasts, the less likely it is to occur uh, because both sides of that contract are going to think they don't want to renew it. The employers, I think, are going to be 
very reluctant until the restaurants are full again to go back to levels of employment that they had before. And that means a lot of people are going to get left out and they're going to have to look elsewhere in order to find a job. So um, um, a question that I've been asking uh, many of our guests and that has been asked by uh, some of uh, our viewers has to do with education. So when we had the first one of these um, seminars, it was before the lockdown and we had it at UCLA. And one of the questions from the public was to, the, um, uh, to Bob uh, Kim Farley, the, um, our public health colleague, was should I get on a plane and travel to Japan? Um, and then I said, well, what about being, all of us being together in this room with you know, shoulder to shoulder? So education is, uh, I think that after barbers, the least social distancing activity. How do you see that going forward? Um, in particular at a place like Anderson where networking and relationships um, are, are so important? Um, uh, so let me, that's a huge question that you asked. So one thing I want to say is that there are two sectors in the economy that have very little concern about cost control, that they can pass the cost on to their customers. <clears throat> one is um, healthcare. The other one is education. We've had a huge increase in tuition. You know, in, inflation went up by a factor of three and tuition went up by a factor of 12 over the same period of time. So we're putting a huge burden on these students because there's no force for cost control. How could that cost control actually be put in place in the case of education at every level? It's through internet-based uh, systems. Now, the downside of that is what you said, is that I, as I really revealed in everything I was saying today, knowledge is created in conversations. And you can't get knowledge just listening to people talk and being, uh, well, you, I'm sorry, you can't, you get knowledge, but you don't get the ability to create the knowledge. You write down what somebody else wrote, what somebody else said, and you memorize it. That's not useful in the world that we're moving into. The world we're moving into is, which has, uh, compu has computers doing all the mundane repetitive tasks, both physical and intellectual. So the job market is increasingly going to rely on problem solving and creativity. And to me, that, <clears throat> that requires one-on-one. -on -one. So I, my, my view of education is, is um, much of it is done in uh, big classrooms, like we're having here 400 people today kind of listening to us talk, or writing notes and talking about it. And then, then there's the one-on-one -on -one relationships that occur in an office. And, and a person acts like an apprentice to uh, to a faculty member, and th that's extremely costly in terms of time, but I think it makes uh, extremely effective education. I'm not sure I well, answered your question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let, let, let's stay a little bit on education here. Uh, you've spent uh, uh, your whole life as an educator, and um, uh, you have uh, played a very important role mentoring a number of people, and, and, and you, you have a real passion here. So. And, and in private conversations between you and I, you've been critical in, uh, of the way in which the um, college and grad school education has evolved during the last few years. So if I go back to, um, I don't know, 40 years, uh, young people either went to the military, they were drafted, or they went to college. Some went straight to the job market, but let's stay with those two groups. And college, it was a lot of fun, I mean, silly things, but really it was a boot camp for the, for the mind, for the brain. They put you through very sort of difficult um, uh, academic uh, drills and so on. And with time, it's become more like a res going to a resort rather than to a boot camp, I, I think. Do you think that this will change and will make education go back to Maybe, maybe I'm idealizing the past, but where it's more going to be sort of tougher and, and, and more like a boot camp, maybe a boot camp to create uh, people, uh, give people the tools for um, uh, problem solving? Well, I think of it, uh, there are two aspects. There's education and there's training. 
Training is what Pavlov does to his dog and gets, in, gets it to bark at just the right time. Most of what happens in classrooms is not education, it's barking. So if I teach you what the ISLM model, and I test you to see if you know that, and if you bark at just the right time, then you get an A. Well, that worked 30, 40 years ago, back in the 50s and 60s. We're, we're just memorizing and responding and becoming one of Pavlov's dogs was a guarantee to a decent living in America. You just wave that college degree and that would get you something great. We're moving into an era in which a college degree waving doesn't get you uh, a great job. You have to bring something to the workforce that a computer can't do. That's problem solving, creativity, and anal analytical thinking. I view is, my view is we need to shift education away from this memorization stuff much more toward creative problem solving, and that's experiential education. You know, I'm involved in those. I was involved in those uh, uh, global trips that I thought were very much oriented toward having, taking a bunch of students to another country and studying that. That was a great experience. And so, so me, much more experiential education is essential in my mind. I love what you said, since uh, we, we run uh, that whole program of global immersion at the CGM, and uh, you were very, a very uh, important uh, element of this. Um, will we continue to travel? So here we are combining what I'm asking you now, two of the questions that are very central uh, for our, our, our audience education and travel will people do you think that is there a future for for the for the airline uh, industry is it is, are we going to go back uh, will people forget i mean on the one hand we see people going to the beaches in large numbers on the other people are careful how do you see this going forward are we going to get back can, when do you think we can go back to have a global immersion and have you lead a group of students to Brazil? So as you were talking, I was thinking what I did on my 75th birthday last year, where I went to Peru and hiked the last leg of the Inca Trail. And to me, that was the most memorable week in my whole life. And so that kind of traveling is an essential part of being a human, a human I believe. And we need to do that, need to travel around the world and around the country. We can only do that when the health authorities get this thing completely under control and give us confidence that there's not another virus that's going to jump out uh, at us when we have our trip. I think we'll get to that, but it's not going to be this year, I don't think. I'm, I'm not inclined to do long distance traveling or, or uh, <clears throat> certainly not cruises this year, but maybe the year after, the year after that. It's hard to predict, but people People have to get comfortable that that uh, where they were a couple of months ago has recreated itself uh, going forward. So I have one last question. There have been uh, uh, several uh, that we've received through Slido along these lines. And it seems to me that this is a little bit more known probabilities and so on. What do you think will happen with the trillions of dollars of US debt? that are being issued and also the trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve has been adding to its balance sheet. Um, is this something that we should worry about or I, we, should, we should just become like Japan and not worry and eat a lot of sushi and be happy? Well, Japan doesn't have that external debt problem the way no, we but do. it has a very large internal debt problem. It has an internal debt, but the external debt is, you know, you've studied this in every country in the world in which the debt gets these countries in trouble. So to me, the, the, what I say rhetorically is uh, Uncle Sam is looking a lot like Uncle Demetrius, even more so, because once the Greeks got access to uh, credit at the same interest rates as the Germans because they joined the EU, then they thought, oh, God, this is great. We can borrow almost for free. And they borrowed through the roof and distributed to their friends. And then we had, a com we had a reckoning when people discovered that their reporting on fiscal policy wasn't completely accurate. And overnight, <clears throat> they were shut down. They've had like a, a, a great depression in, in Greece ever since that. So the U.S. faces the same risk, that if the global bond market starts seeing problems with regard to Uncle Sam living up to the promises, 
<clears throat> then they're going to uh, un unwind and get rid of that debt, and we're going to have a huge Argentine, the Mexico, Greece kind of issue. So uh, let me ask you for uh, maybe um, we, we are unfortunately running out of time. So one last uh, statement, words of wisdom. Uh, maybe along the lines, uh, if you want, of what you said uh, at the opening, when you um, counseled us and suggested that we write something down every day. Um, on, uh, now that you, you, you have uh, hundreds of people looking at you, words of wisdom uh, for us to think over during the next uh, week or so. Well, I, the, my last slide some, some, said something that's important as well, is that we should recognize that we're all Americans. I would extend that to say we're all global humans. We're all in the same struggle against this coronavirus and, and a struggle similarly against climate change. And we need to be working together to achieve uh, success with regard to both of those issues. I cannot let you go without going a little bit further on what you just said, uh, because I think it's very important and I agree with you. So one of the things that we keep hearing uh, um, after the lockdown um, is people saying how difficult it is to be a teacher, an elementary school teacher. So there are these families that now have two kids or maybe three at home, and they really now understand the difficulties. And many people are saying, we should pay our teachers more. You mentioned something along those lines. Then when I hear that, I ask people, are you willing to have your property taxes increased by 30%? And the answer has been invariably no. And there is this disconnect between rewarding people who really make huge contributions to society, like teachers, and paying for it. What, what's going on, man? Well, again, I think I've said this before, which is that we, we're a country that has, has um, valued materialistic success. If your car is better than mine, if your house is bigger and better than mine, if your income is 10 times as much as mine, then I envy you. And that's been the driving force for the U.S. economy for a long period of time. That works when, the, when uh, everybody has access to the success of the very top, but we're moving in a situation which that isn't true anymore. So we need a new, we need a cultural change that instead of valuing materialistic success, we value the people who make the biggest contributions to our communities and see that they're well taken care of. Thank you, Ed. Those are very uh, important words. Uh, we at Anderson, try to combine that, of course. We want our students when they graduate and they go out to life to be very successful. But we also are very proud of uh, uh, all our former students who make great contributions to our society. Thanks again, Professor Ed Lemer, Thank for you. this great talk. And let me make an announcement. Next week, we have uh, Professor Chris Tang, who is going to talk about the global supply chain and how it's changing and will change because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And then we have Professor uh, Roman uh, Vaxier, uh, who is going to talk to us about political ramifications of the crisis. And then we have two or three more talks, uh, which I will announce in due course. Thanks again, Ed. Uh, thanks, everyone. Be good, be safe, and stay healthy.